I acknowledge the land upon which this library and all of the district's libraries sit is on the traditional land of the Anacostan people of the Piscataway tribe, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We pay respect to their elders, both past and present. Welcome, National Student Poets of 2020. You're late. You're, you're very late. Uh, you have an excuse, I know, but I just want to say Harold Bloom, the great uh, critic, uh, said all great poets are ultimately belated poets, late poets. And I'll come back to that in, uh, in one second. But it's great to see you. And Isabella, thank you for your welcome. Uh, T.S. Eliot, in fact, uh, might be called uh, our greatest poet. Now, that's arguable, of course if your favorite poet is Dickinson or uh, Whitman or Stevens. So I'll just say he's the greatest uh, St. Louis poet. Uh, now, that's actually a fairly high bar when you think that Marianne Moore and, Sos and Sosaki Change, uh, Maya Angelou, uh, we could throw in Tennessee Williams, uh, and uh, of course, Irma Rombauer. Now, you may ask, who is Irma Rombauer? It's older people might know, the author of The Joy of Cooking, which has the greatest line in American literature, the greatest first line in American literature. The first line of her fir first edition of The Joy of Cooking is, stand facing the stove. <laughs> now, that's an adamantine uh, line. It's, 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 a, it's a perfect line. It expresses everything. Um, and, and so I want you to keep that in mind and, uh, uh, as, as I uh, go through the rest of my peroration here. Uh, it, T.S. Eliot said, the reason I bring him up, is he said in his great uh, essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent, uh, arguably the most argued about uh, essay on poetry, uh, that uh, it is uh, the attempt of the great poet to eliminate personality uh, and to adhere to presence, uh, the presence of previous poets, great poets, the great history of literature, uh, and their own ability to add to that presence. Um, now, Harold Bloom, I come back to, to Harold Bloom. Harold Bloom's view was a little bit different. He felt that poetry was, that poets were wrestling with their fathers and mothers. The belated poets are the greatest poets because they're the greatest wrestlers with the earlier poets. And, and then I come to the, to, to, to the uh, uh, class of 2021 and their poetry. Uh, Eliot and Bloom wanted to eliminate personality, and, uh, and yet your poems are all about personality. They're all about identity. They're about your cultural identity, your family identity, your religious identity, your racial identity, sexual identity. They're about who you are and who you're, what your environment is surrounding you. And so we have to ask ourselves, who's right? Keats. Keats wrote about beauty. And, had a Grecian urn that he, that he wrote about. Uh, uh, is, is it about, about beauty or about identity? Um, is it about presence? Is it about personality? Well, here I want to give you an example. Uh, you'll hear from uh, the great uh, poet laureate of the United States, former poet laureate of the United States in a moment, Natasha Trethewey. Uh, but I want to read just uh, uh, two lines, uh, really, from uh, her poem. Alignment, which is about a woodpecker. It's from her book, uh, Monument. Uh, and uh, it's about a single woodpecker. Uh, and, and she says uh, it, it, that the single wood, woodpecker uh, at his task is uh, something from the cluttered house of memory. And it seems to me that that is a definition of where poetry comes from, the cluttered house of memory. And then she talks about uh, the woodpecker, uh, hard, hard at work, and after that hard day's work, he, the woodpecker has made, making the green hearts, the leaves, making the green hearts flutter. And it seems to me that's both power and presence and beauty and reordering the world. Uh, it, it is what Eliot and Bloom thought of. Uh, it is what great poets always do. And in the, the personality that 
and the identity that you all have discovered uh, in your lives, in your families in particular. I think almost all the poems, uh, almost all of you write poems about family. Uh, you have found uh, something of beauty uh, and something uh, of power and something of presence. Uh, and so I welcome you uh, to uh, the stage, uh, not only to this stage, uh, but uh, to the stage of uh, national American poetry, uh, which you are, you have earned a place in. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Wisniewski, and I am the executive director of the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, which is the nonprofit organization that presents the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards and uh, the organization that administers the National Student Poets Program. Uh, the young people that we're recognizing today um, have uh, accomplished something really tremendous, and it starts with a submission to the Scholastic Awards, right? And uh, after winning National Medals in Poetry, they were invited to submit more work as semifinalists for this honor. And today they stand before you as uh, one among five uh, young people who um, are receiving our country's highest honor for youth poets. Um, and that honor comes with it a charge um, to um, pay the investment that we're making in them forward through service to their community and to their country. Um, and that's uh, the journey that they're embarking on today. And I'm so thrilled um, to be here with them to both congratulate them and to send them off on the good work that they're going to do. Um, we could not um, run this program without our partners at the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, that's because they pay for it, of course. <laughs> Um, but also because they're so much more than a funding partner. Um, this is a genuine collaboration. And so I want to start my list of thank yous today by thanking the IMLS, Crosby Kemper, um, and our partner uh, in crime, uh, Dennis Nangle, um, for their extraordinary investment in this program. Um, it is a labor of love for the Alliance and the IMLS, and um, we really do mean that. Um, it's also a labor of love for um, its co-founder, and in many ways its guiding light, Olivia Morgan, who's here with us today. Um, yes, Olivia deserves a, a huge round of applause. Um, the dedication that she shows um, on top of her um, incredibly demanding day job um, to ensure that this program um, continues and grows and um, continues to blossom um, into the best version of itself um, is really inspiring to me. And uh, I know that she's especially proud that this group of five brings us to 50 national student poets. So we celebrate 10 years of the program next year. Um, I also, of course, would not be here without uh, my colleagues at the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, Hannah Jones, who <laughs> is the program manager, but also uh, when we talk about labors of love, um, gives Olivia a run for her money in terms of her, her dedication and commitment to this work. Um, Miranda Dubner. Um, who um, is Hannah's closest collaborator, but the entire staff at the Alliance believes um, in this program and really um, supports us day in and day out, and we could not do this without them. Um, we also could not do this without Kelly Forsyth. Thank you for your support. And um, an extraordinary list of funding partners, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Hearthland Foundation, the Academy of American Poets, the Poetry Foundation. Um, we thank all of those organizations for supporting the National Student Poets Program. And uh, a special thanks to Natasha Trethaway for joining us today. And uh, 
to our wonderful friends at Blue Flower Arts who um, really go above and beyond um, in helping us um, recognize uh, these young poets with extraordinary keynote speakers and jurors who um, really, I think, exemplify the quality of this program. Um, and it's really humbling to be a part of it. So, um, so enough from me. Um, I'm not a poet, and we want to hear from some poets. Um, and so to conclude their year of service, um, our uh, 2020 class of National Student Poets will be delivering their final poems tonight at a private event. Um, today, at this event, they've offered to give the incoming class um, a few words of wisdom as you embark on your year of service. So I'd like to invite the class of 2020 up to the stage. I'm Maddie Dietz, and I represented the Midwest region for the year of 2020. Um, remember to be kind to yourselves, both mentally and physically. Give yourselves the same empathy and grace that you give others. Even when you're writing poetry, you're taking care to place yourself in other people's shoes, to see the world as others see it. So give yourself the same grace. Thank you. Hi, my name is Isabella Ramirez, and I represented the Southeast region of the United States. And what I would say to the class of 2021 is take a moment to be proud of yourself. Um, I know as a poet, it can be really difficult to deal with imposter syndrome and also sometimes dealing with the stress that comes with the responsibility that you will now bear. But please take that moment to just realize how amazing you guys are and how far you've come and how much you have um, how big of an opportunity this is. So please revel in those moments and appreciate the little things because it'll go a long way. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mona Seekerg and I was the National Student Poet of the West for 2020. And my advice to the class of 2021 would be, don't be afraid to let yourself and your poetry change. I think something I struggled with this year was just feeling that now I had achieved so much recognition for my current portfolio, I felt that I had to stay in that mold and I was scared to grow um, as, an, as a writer and um, I felt that I had like so many expectations on me, um, but I think it's just so important to remember that ultimately you're writing for yourself and for your own joy and not for an audience. Yeah. Hi, I'm Anthony Wiles. I represented the Northeast in 2020. And my advice for you all as the class of 2021 is to enjoy learning and serving. You will learn so much from one another and the relationships that you all forge between yourselves, but also from the adults in the program and the communities and partners that you will work with. Um, and enjoy serving one another. You all have been gifted with this beautiful gift of poetry and being able to write um, and share these stories with one another and with your communities as a whole. Enjoy serving people and learning from them and their stories and enjoy the impacts that you will have on any person and any program that you come across. Uh, hi, I'm Ethan Wong. I represented the Southwest for the 2020 National Student Poets. And my advice for the 2021 National Student Poets is Looking back on my year, I feel like there were a lot of individual moments where I had a lot of worry about the program, about whatever. I'd say to think about just enjoying and trying to savor every moment that you get. There are going to be times when you're fawning over people you get to meet, where you're fawned over for who you are and what you accomplish. And I think, and just enjoy every moment of that and make sure to savor it because a year sounds like a lot of time, it's really not.
So one of my um, biggest regrets from the pandemic is that um, these five amazing young poets didn't get a chance to have this experience themselves. So if we could just take one more moment to recognize and applaud the class of 2020. You all inspire us. Now, it's our pleasure to invite um, each of the new National Student Poets to uh, receive their certificates and um, read us some of their poetry. And we will start with the new National Student Poet of the Midwest, R.C. Davis. Uh, my name is R.C. Davis. I am the National Student Poet of the Midwest. Uh, the title of this first poem I'm gonna read is Chicken Boy. Really half my life ago when you think about it. Those afternoons where Mia and I would shove the word chicken into each other's ribs and try to jump from my treehouse without using any knees. We played pirates mostly when it wasn't a series of successive dares. I was always first mate. Grass and ocean in my spit, long-armed enough to reach every rope. Some Friday evening with mulberries on our lips, Mia asked me why I always played a boy. What does it mean to keep a secret you haven't learned yet? After that, I always made sure to be somewhat girl in every game, ponytail licking the wind with my walk the plank leap. I apologize for any cliche, any legitimacy I give to this notion of narrative. Who decided that a trans childhood has to be a psychoanalysis? I knew and I didn't know. I was a girl unfurling into man, chicken boy chewing her talons into dust. I jumped off the treehouse nine years ago and I still haven't landed. Uh, this next poem is called Promise. I promise never to charge my phone on the rim of the bathtub or cut off my fingertips with a kitchen knife. If I know one thing, it's how to touch the wax of a mosquito candle without feeling any burn. This summer, the dog eats cicadas in the grass and I dream that I'm a duck or something else with wings. In the end, I am swallowed once again by my own skin, riding a bicycle backwards down a hill in a poem that isn't this one, I keep asking for my parents' pride to never change its shape. I ask the birds and each blade of grass, mostly my own mouth in the mirror. Canyon of teeth singing a song too low for my vocal range. Someday I will tattoo a window on each of my shoulders to let some light in, I suppose, like a pair of glasses in a movie setting fire to a leaf, dollop of sun, then everything begins burning. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to taste when we say words like future. I promise you that if I ever have a child of my own, my hands won't shake so much that I drop them on the tile. I'll remember some of the words of my father's lullabies. We'll count the dead flies on the windowsill. Then I'll turn over a tree stump and show the swarm underneath. Look, the moon is a paper plate that's been lit on fire. Watch it curl into a toenail clipping. Watch the night swallow us in our pajama pants and whispers. Today, what I'm asking is for my parents to call me son before one of us is dead. If you look directly at the sun, it leaves blue spots everywhere. And I'm sitting here painting my nails with the blood from my mosquito bites. Thank you. Thank you, RC. Our next poet is the new National Student Poet of the Southeast, Annika Aragon. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Anika Aragam, and I'm the new National Student Poet for the Southeast. This poem is called, When You Wish Upon a Star. In the backyard, evening splits yoke-like over the sea of switchgrass. A lone dandelion shoots up from the porch slats. I crush it in my fist and blow. I am thinking about mother, about unborn sister, about storks that chuck babies from the sky into eager arms, the homes they miss, or the baskets that are empty to begin with. Winter two years before I was born, mother cast a wish on a star long dead, and that is why I am the eldest, instead of Leela, whose sonogram she still keeps in a shoebox. Two. Father once told me of his grade school days spent scaling rooftops, all to steal glances at the lone television on the block, flickering in his neighbor's window like wildfire. I picture him fresh-faced, youthful, breath caught like a guppy in a fisherman's reel each time the credits rolled. Now, he buries away after dusk, action films droning, and I imagine he sees a supernova in every fight scene a jaw shattering into a million constellations, colliding with another's knuckle, the space where his fist could have been. He says, it wasn't written in my stars. He says, there's no use pining. But he hurries to the theater every weekend, basks in the screen's glare like sunshine on a cold afternoon. Three, once a month, Cousin calls to ask if she can visit. Says she can't stand the empty cavern of her one-bedroom apartment in Detroit. The wedding band glinting on her finger like the scales of a python coiled tight around prey it will not kill but choke. She's forgotten the slope of her husband's face, my cousin. Like last year, his visa denied. I picture them both as mantids, eyes bulbous, upturned fingers clasped and reaching, same sky, same prayer. Or, on the porch steps now, I thumb the lines fraying like roots on my palm, gaze at the freckled expanse of night, trace constellations, Orion, the little dipper. Can't decide which part of this poem I hate the most, the way they sigh or the way they hope, the way they hold my gaze like a promise, like something they're owed. This next poem is called Guzzle for Desi Potluck. And in every corner, 80s bungra spilling from loudspeakers, lulls in chatter broken by a rice cooker's steam whistle. On TV, home alone to quell idle children. They watch eyes wide, Kevin's family leave for the airport without him, wonder what they do if alone at home or far away. In the living room, the new couple flit in and out of chatter like fruit flies, uneasy even among themselves, ever the loners. Ma sees something of herself in the young wife, the way she sniffs her kurti for the suitcase sullied scent of home strokes the bloom of her belly as if glass blown. This is real tender loving. Plates of pulao stacked high for young and old till no belly is left wanting. For Ma insists no one should eat alone. Picture how this night will end on the doorstep, lingering. This evening, a lifeboat. To take leave is to capsize, but at least no one's drowning alone. Thank you. The National Student Poet from the Northeast, Kevin Gu. Hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Gu. I'm the National Student Poet for the Northeast. 
This is my poem, Georgia, Atlanta, Ululation, a response written after the shooting on March 16. Tonight, you chew raw tongue and watch how street lights make true the vacancy in your eyes, your gaze. You prepare to rupture soft under grease slick lights, a body splayed under artificial dung long. And notice how dust traces yellow lit rivers, Huang He down a straining neck. The trembling tells you it's time to siphon your life away, all steamed bones, all unwanted broth. Open yourself wider. On a night like this, the only thing unwinding is your shot out brain. Body laid bare and blossomed, worthy sacrifice to a silent God, an inheritance. Long? Maybe you convince yourself to ignore the air hollow gap throbbing like curdled steel in your flesh. Maybe you choose to stay flayed on the permafloor, palms facing upwards towards heaven, wordless begging to reclaim a once livid voice but it is all too painful, and so you remain still. On a night like this, you are reduced to a lovely skin, star, anise, and gunpowder, how those spices cling to you, tender, a softening, consumed only by yellowing teeth and unhinged mouths. Wide her, hide her, finger on trigger, March 16. Remember that day, how you spilled racking organs onto the linoleum, how you thought your lungs filled with the synthetic incense of a foreign place, but it was just the smoke, long, and you, burning from the inside, unnamed empty body, mercy, mercy, mercy. Through this, you learn how you are replaceable, omitted, how history rewrites again to rid itself of your skeleton, and how it molds you, Eastern sexual tantalization for a man who had a bad day. A bad day to screech metal lullabies into your gut, cracked open a lifetime. Translations. Long, Mandarin, lanterns, deaf, sound warmed in a throat, scarred in all its beauty. Long, English, some shooter's name, killer, rust metal syllable deposited on a tongue. Next, I'll be reading the English translation of my poem, Red Gold. Teach me how to paint those tattered juice stains, red blood-lit flowers sipping on my saggy low-rise jeans, crimson lanterns emanating under the expansive New Year sky. Let me trace the upward curves of my eyes, pulling reflections into almond wax crayons, and how my skin, yellow ochre, shrivels under leering gazes, like rotting kumquat fruits in the summer heat. Teach me how to pull the noisy 3 p.m. afternoons of the Chinese market into my grandmother's embrace, I pray I'll remember the ginseng perfume that loiters in my nostrils and the jade necklace that boils deep in my oolong tea. Tell me the stories of market vendors that sell seared fish, electric fan weaving the wafting threads of salt and peppercorns, and remind me to be proud of these scrawny bones, angles of a clock's hands, the breadth of the joints marked with crooked indents. Let me, 
my lysome eyes. Gossamer flecks in whispers meandering towards the light years. Distill red gold silk, drink it in. Cough up lychee berry juice that simmers in my lungs and scream with firecrackers that light up the burning silence. I'll watch the golden skin dragons flutter down from shattered mirrors, sending soot and blotted velvet into the concrete. Cut paper and smell the snowflakes. Aren't they saccharine like sugar water and smoke? Thank you. A national student poet from the Southwest, Keiichi Mba. Hello, my name is Keiichi Mba. I'm the 2021 national student poet representing the Southwest region. And today I'll be reading two poems. The first titled, Red-Eyed Woman. Red-eyed woman, won't you wake today, thumb through the waiting morning, undress from your dreams, chew on rotten berries, slow hissing juice dripping down your teeth. Now you'll wash that hair in a snap of green bush, tangled, twigged, and scratching. Grow wild, honey, browned and sticky. Rub the burn across your skin. Watch the winds peel it back for you. Don't wait. Drag those fingernails in the dirt. Let them go bent, black, and nasty. Sprinkle what's left to bake on the opened white flesh of your thigh. There, it's still burning. That smell, that awful smell is like home and has itself strapped to your boot. Take it off and throw it behind you. Inhale once. Inhale twice, release a scraggly howl for the river and tomorrow. See only one follow. Cup your mouth to the water, swish, let it know the wet, then spit, keep the thirsty. It gets cold and the happy fat shrinks off your belly, so you eat the chapped flakes from your lips. All those memories already faded fading, gone. And the next poem I'll be reading is titled, My Great-Grandfather Had Nine Wives. My great-grandfather had nine wives. Until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Chinue Achebe. Egu adia toafo uburuzo. My great-grandfather's squinting eyes drew haze over the horizon belonging to my great-grandmother, creating a painting of African sun. She was a woman of the earth. The earth made woman of her. Dirt-laced fingers and sand-peppered knees spoke love to corn and cassava, praying only to the god she held within her bosom. At the rise of afternoon, pestle etched callus as she pounded for food into brown freckled mortar. Like all men, my great-grandfather admired his yellowed eyes enchanted by her flat nose and cow belly plump lips, to her skin peeled ripe from ebony and hips whipped wide for birth, to the sweet smell of a hard-working woman. So he grew chest and three goats to bring back to her village, and she agreed to be his seventh wife. Uto mi wetebele. Drums beat to the laughter of pot-bellied men. Wine carrying is the wedding. My great-grandfather squatted hidden maya bush leaves while my great-grandmother's feet kissed the ground to its pulsing rhythm, red wrapper bouncing to her waist, palm wine swimming in the ivory tusk for her forefathers. She searched through purple plume grass and behind corkwood trees, only finding men pretending to be my great-grandfather, until the rustle of Mariah Bush leaves seized her eyes, tusk weighed his hands, palm wine touched his lips, and a river stretched out around their families. Manu akara dioto, onyeratu, ibe My great-grandfather's land could make a village, 
splitting vasts of dust rich colors. For each wife had a house of her own, and they stuck together tightly, clay, woman, bamboo stick, children, leading to feasts that were long and winding, sun-fed siblings chasing behind the shadows of their mothers, and snapping stomachs waiting for the dent of gari to be filled with akra soup, the open air hugging them tenderly. Thank you. and the national student poet from the West, Sarah Fatima Mohammed. Hi, I'm Sarah Fatima Mohammed, um, and I'm the national student poet of the West. Ode to Muslim girl. In the mosque, women stir in slow circles, following the blue lilt of my mother's cotton hijab I move past these women, their burqas brushing against mine, their bodies so lovely and gentle, their mouths brimming with sweet hummel vowels and knitted songs of worship. I kneel beside my mother, tucked in the corner of the room, both of us curling and uncurling our hands, our prayer rug a field tendrilled in sea silk. We are here, I murmur, skimming my thumb along her jaw, and by this I mean we are home. On days like these, the air heavy as pearls, heavy as daughters, I keep looking into my mother's face, so warm and so dark, and I am overcome with the softness of her. The way she opens the last verses of the Quran, moon clotted and steamed in rose milk, the way she cradles my cheek, a small synonym, the way she murmurs back to me, we are here, the words settling over me like skin. And I remember the softness. I cling to the memory of the softness when, after school, I struggle against the boy in the empty classroom until he relents, until he moves the hard meat of his knuckles from my waist, my body so small and trembling, when he asks where I'm going, the answer is a tender thing blooming in my mouth, and he responds, have fun with all the other terrorists, his chuckle following me like footsteps, filling the damp streets as I trudge to the mosque, slip into the prayer room, my mother coiling close. The prayer rug becomes a garden growing underneath us, a smattering of pink petals pinned to our bare feet, gentle as touch. On returning to my people, sugar apples clot the road with softness, their green skins quilted like small fields and damp curled palms. I gather two in my hands, pressing the warmth to my cheek because I want to bring them home to the one room place where we call every woman sister, where we brush coconut oil over our lips and sing prayers, our voices thick as cotton. Mostly, the fruit reminds me of some sweetness I've been longing for, heavy and forgiving, the sweetness where I say my people and my people are here, women gathered close to me, their burqas flowing, Smatterings of tumult press between us when I rest my head against theirs, feeling so held and whole. I remember the village road that touches the river with such gentleness. I remember my sisters and their bodies, curved and whole as lovely sketches of the moon. My hands full of sugar apples and memory, I wander home. A woman carrying a bucket of water grazes my body, I remember her name, Najima, how she took care of me when I was young, drying my wet hair after baths. She looks at my face, touches her own, our aquiline noses, our bloated mouths. We look the same, and she calls me Fatima, my name curled in her belly.
congratulations and thank you. Um, I am twice humbled um, in this moment because um, I um, have to follow that. <laughs> And I also have the uh, privilege of introducing our keynote speaker, uh, the 19th United States Poet Laureate, Natasha Trethaway. Thank you. You guys are fantastic. I, I'm blown away. Would you join me in one more round of applause? For these Makes me think about my most spent youth. Uh, wow. I'm really uh, delighted to be here with all of you, and you especially, and you outgoing poets, on this very special occasion. I wrote my earliest poems when I was in the third grade. What I remember most about them is that already I was concerned with history, with historical memory. I recall writing an ode and an elegy to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., along with poems about African American history, my first attempts to create monuments in language to parts of history often subjugated or overlooked, especially in the places where I was growing up. I was born in Mississippi on Confederate Memorial Day, a holiday glorifying the lost cause the attempt to destroy the Union in order to maintain slavery and white supremacy. The Confederate flag flew all across my native South, and monuments inscribed the landscape with the narrative of white supremacy and black subjugation, overwriting our shared history as Americans. For example, that nearly 200,000 black soldiers fought for the Union in order to preserve it, and to help bring our nation closer to realizing the ideals laid out in our founding documents. I saw no monuments to those soldiers when I was growing up in the shadow of Stone Mountain, Georgia, the largest monument to the Confederacy, the metaphor of it looming over everything, sending its message to us. When I was born in 1966, my parents' interracial marriage was illegal in Mississippi and in as many as 20 other states in the nation, rendering me illegitimate in the eyes of the law, persona non grata. I can see now that my earliest poems were attempts to push back against such oppressive narratives, to claim my rightful equal place as citizen, and leading me toward my enduring project as a poet to demand a fuller recognition of and reckoning with our national history, and our national amnesia. Poetry gave me a voice to contend with all of that, the sheer pleasure of it, the heft of certain words on the tongue, the musical delights, the lyricism and rhythm of syntax, the power of images and figurative language to make the mind leap to a new apprehension of things. My third grade teacher bound my earliest poems, and the librarian at my school placed my volume on the shelves with other collections of poetry, and I felt part of an ongoing conversation with poets across time and space, adding my voice to it. Many years later, I would return to my earliest subject matter in this poem, Miscegenation. In 1965, my parents broke two laws of Mississippi. They went to Ohio to marry, returned to Mississippi. They crossed the river into Cincinnati, a city whose name begins with a sound like sin, the sound of wrong, miss in Mississippi. A year later, they moved to Canada, followed a route the same as slaves, the train slicing the white glaze of winter, leaving Mississippi. Faulkner's Joe Christmas was born in winter, like Jesus, given his name for the day he was left at the orphanage, his race unknown in Mississippi. 
My father was reading War and Peace when he gave me my name. I was born near Easter, 1966, in Mississippi. When I turned 33, my father said, it's your Jesus year. You're the same age he was when he died. It was spring, the hills green in Mississippi. I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. I was lucky in school to have studied lots of poets, including African-American poets Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Langston Hughes, Counte Cullen, and Gwendolyn Brooks. From that curriculum, I learned that there were poems that could help to make sense of the past and reckon with the ongoing injustices of the present. When I started eighth grade, bust into a white school where I encountered children who hissed racial slurs at us as they brushed past in the halls, I could recall Counte Cullen's incident. It's a short poem, and in its musicality, its rhyme, quite memorable. Incident. Once riding in old Baltimore, heart filled, head filled with glee, I saw a Baltimorean keep looking straight at me. Now I was eight and very small, and he was no whit bigger. And so I smiled, but he poked out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until December of all the things that happened there. That's all that I remember. In that strange new school, and as an adolescent trying to find my place, poems showed me the ways of the world, celebrated it, but also spoke back to what was wrong in it and created in language a kind of justice. Also, at that time, I was going through something difficult at home that no one knew about. At school, I was the editor of the school newspaper, a member of the literary society. I was on the gymnastics team, captain of the cheerleading squad, a two-time All-American. And that's how my classmates and my teachers knew me. At home, I was living in a house of domestic violence, physical abuse of my mother, psychological and emotional abuse toward me at the hands of a stepfather, a troubled Vietnam veteran with a history of mental illness. I can remember reading Edward Arlington Robinson's Richard Corey in an English class and feeling as though the language of the poem was speaking to an aspect of my own experience, the truth that people who looked at you might not understand your private suffering. This is Richard Corey. Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from soul to crown, clean, favored, and imperially slim. And he was always quietly arrayed, and he was always human when he talked. But still he fluttered pulses when he said, good morning, and he glittered when he walked. And he was rich, yes, richer than a king and admirably schooled in every grace. In fine, we thought that he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. So on we worked and waited for the light and went without the meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. Unlike Richard Corey, My private suffering led me to poetry. When I was 19, my mother was killed, and in the first few weeks after her death, I turned to poetry, an attempt to put into language what I was feeling, to make sense of it. I could think of no other place but a poem that the pain of my loss might find its just articulation. So I tried writing one for the first time since those heady days of elementary school because something catastrophic had happened. It was an awful poem, but I needed to do it. Then I read W.H. Auden's Musée de Beaux-Arts. 
That poem begins, about suffering they were never wrong, the old masters, how well they understood its human position, how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along. The poem goes on to describe scenes from several paintings and ends with this final stanza. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. I was immediately taken by those first lines. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. It was as if the poem were speaking directly to me, and I was ready, almost daring it to prove something it knew in the abstract about suffering that I now understood intimately. It seems a natural response after a traumatic experience and the range of emotions, including anger, that comes with it, to believe that no one can understand what it feels like, that we are alone in our pain. The world goes on. And the poem proceeds with this notion, setting out its argument with a series of images as examples from various paintings that address the juxtaposition of suffering and the mundane dailiness of the world, what we're seeing right now, how small the individual tragedy or loss can seem, ignored or unnoticed in a corner. It might seem unsettling to be reminded that the world goes on oblivious to tragedy, to our individual losses. But in Auden's vision, if suffering isolates us, it connects us too. The poem showed me that I was not alone in the experience of being alone in my suffering, that across time and space, others had and would continue to suffer, and that a single voice could speak into the silence, the emptiness that my mother's death left in my life. This is the great cultural force of poetry. In its intimacy, the individual voice of the poem can show us ourselves by showing us the interior life of someone else, can inspire in us great empathy, a sacred gift, and can bring us back from the depths of despair. As William Faulkner put it in his Nobel acceptance speech, the poet's voice need not merely be the record of humankind. It can be one of the props, the pillars to help us endure and prevail. That is why the work you will do as our national student poets, bringing poetry to our communities, encouraging self-discovery, imparting the invaluable skills inherent in poetry, and inspiring your peers to dream, work hard, and achieve is so necessary and important. You are ambassadors for the power of poetry to transform our lives in countless ways that are sometimes hard to see, but no less real. My own life is evidence of that. You never know what life, through poetry, you might save. Congratulations on your excellence, achievements, and selection as our national student poets. Thank you so much. And one more round for <laughs> Natasha Kaffaray. This is the beginning. Um, so uh, today uh, is about recognizing what you've accomplished, but um, it's also about setting you forth on uh, your year of service. 
And um, to honor the class of 2020 one last time as well, I think they demonstrated to us that uh, now more than ever um, in a, a period of, of crisis and um, a dark time where there is much suffering, um, the work that you all will be doing um, is more valuable than ever. And um, we're just really excited to see what you'll do. So thank you, everybody, for being with us today. And congratulations.